Sounds good. All right, folks, thank you all for tuning in tonight. We have as our presenter, and this is by my counts the 78th Mountain Zoom we've done since March. So, uh, so we're um, glad for you all to join us and have so many, many folks from different, different parts of the country tuning in. Our presenter this evening, he used to be a 4-H agent for several years here in Wise County, Virginia, and now he's an A&R extension agent up in his home county of Bland, um, Virginia. And uh, he's going to be talking to you about um, keys to a successful lambing season. And, uh, and I assume he's also going to touch some on, on a kidding season if you're, you're a goat producer as well. So, uh, so Hunter, thank you for speaking with us this evening. And uh, I know Hunter's been, uh, he and his family have raised sheep for many years. And uh, I think you'll enjoy this presentation tonight. So Hunter, take it away. All right, thanks, Phil. Um, so like Phil said, um, I used to be the 4-H agent in um, Wise County for seven years. Um, I've been back in my home county for two years. Um, you can see up on the wall, not very well, but I have my map of Wise County that they gave me before I left. So still keep them in my mind a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I've grown up on a farm my entire life and we've been uh, sheep producers for um, 15 years now. Uh, before I get started with all this, I want everyone to know I'm, what I'm saying is not gospel. <laughs> These are just going to be things that um, we've personally done and experienced on our farm and things that um, we think can probably help new producers um, when getting through their first or second uh, lambing or kidding season. Um, so here are the main things that we're going to talk about today. Feeding plans, medical care, lambing window and shelters, what to do when you have new lambs, and pasture and beyond. So that's going to focus on marketing your lambs once um, you've got them weaned and later on into the summer. So the first thing you need to come up with um, when we're talking about pregnant ewes or, um, you know, getting ewes ready to be bred is a feeding plan. Um, the biggest part of a sheep diet is forage. So <clears throat> especially during late gestation for ewes, you wanna have good quality hay um, that you're feeding every day, free choice. Um, a lot of producers like to focus on alfalfa. Um, my farm does not necessarily do that. It's great if you have the means and uh, can either A, afford to purchase alfalfa hay or produce it yourself. But we try to focus more on what we have growing on the farm. So. That's mostly native grasses. Um, we've got a lot of clover. We've got some orchard grass and a lot of fescue that we turn into hay every year and we feed our sheep constantly um, pretty much through the winter. Um, we spend a good deal of time trying to get rid of noxious weeds in those pastures. So instead of going out and trying to purchase hay from other places, we, you know, put most of our resources into just creating the best product that we can on our own uh, property. It's also good for the animals to, you know, have hay from the same place that they've been grazing all year because you can bring in different things from other farms that your flock or your herd isn't used to um, and that can cause issues. Um, the next thing with a feeding plan is to decide whether or not you're going to be feeding grain. Um, if you're going to grain or silage, uh, we focus on purchase grains that um, we get from a local feed mill in Wythe County. Um, we typically only feed from November to March. That's, you know, our pastures are pretty much gone during that time. So, uh, we do a flat rate feeding. So we feed the same thing to all of our ewes during gestation and after they have their lambs, um, like I said, from November to March. Um, another option that you could do is step rate feeding, which that's um, giving sheep a certain amount of feed and then gradually increasing that the closer that they get to um, 
closer to lambing and the same thing with goats. The closer to kidding, you increase their feed um, whenever those due dates get close. Um, the final part of a feed plan that you should focus on is your feed bunk management. Um, sheep and goats will uh, dominate the weaker members of their flock or their herd. So creating a space where all the animals can eat at one time and have, um, you know, have the same amount of feed available is really key to producing um, good lambs and kids across the board. Um, we've had some ewes that will just absolutely keep other ewes from eating. Um, and then we've got to separate them and then give them extra feed and it just creates more work for you. So if you have a big enough space where <clears throat> you can, like I said, allow all of them to eat at the same time. This also helps you um, to be able to watch your animals. You can see what their progression in pregnancy is. You can see if any of them are getting close to lambing or kidding. And if that's the case, if you want, you can separate them out and you know, kind of get them prepared to have their babies. Um, to that same effect, you will also be able to see if one of your ewes is doing poorly, if it's not um, getting enough nutrition, if it's not growing um, fast enough or large enough to have their babies, that, um, that feed bunk time is when you're going to be able to, you know, notice those type of things and figure out what you need to do to produce a better mother. Um. So <clears throat> here's a list that I put together of the best hay stuffs for sheep. Um, this is very similar for goats as well. Um, like I said, we have a lot of orchard grass here, tall fescue, um, timothy, and red and white clover. Um, everything on this list right here will make good hay for sheep um, any time of the year, but it, um, it'll be just as good during um, you know, lambing season and gestation. Medical care is the next thing um, that you should be focusing on before you have your lambs. Um, vaccinations are important. Um, they should be done four to six weeks before lambing. Um, your use, if it's done during that time period, will pass antibodies on to their lambs. Um, the closer that you get to lambing, the vaccines, the antibodies haven't built up in the ewe enough yet, and they're not going to pass those on to their new babies. Um, so the vaccine that I'm talking about specifically, it's called CDT. Um, what that is preventing, it's called the CD part is enterotoxemia type C and type D. Um, type C is known as bloody scours. Um, that typically happens in very young lambs that, you know, are in their first few weeks of life. Um, it's a bacteria that gets in their body and just causes them to dehydrate. Um, and there's pretty much no coming back from that in lambs. If they get uh, enterotoxemia type C, they're pretty much done for. Enterotoxemia type D, um, which is the other part of this vaccination, it's known as overeating disease. And it typically forms a few weeks after a lamb has been born. And it generally happens to your biggest and best lambs, the ones that are growing fast, they're getting big, they look really good. And they get this bacteria that just causes them to constantly eat and bloat and they can die from that. And then the T part of the CDT vac vaccination is tetanus or lockjaw. Um, we all know what tetanus is. If a lamb gets it, that's pretty much it for that lamb. Um, so like I said, four to six weeks before lambing, uh, this is called passive immunity. So that's the you passing on those antibodies to the lamb or to the kids. Um, you can vaccinate lambs after they've been born if you decide you don't wanna vaccinate your ewes. But typically um, those vaccines don't do a lot in really young lambs. It takes, um, they need to be you know, a few weeks older 
before those antibodies are really going to build up um, in those new babies. The next thing is deworming. Um, <clears throat> I'm personally not a big fan of deworming. We do it sometimes when we absolutely have to, but like I have on the screen, worms become easily resistant to deworming medicines. So in the winter time, when you know all those bugs and worms and stuff like that are dead, we don't worm at all. Um, we typically will worm in the spring once it starts getting a little warmer. Um, or if we can obviously see that one of our sheep has, has something wrong with it. Um, the biggest sign to tell when a sheep needs deworming is their jaw. Their jaw will bloat up um, and it'll look like they have, you know, like a sore tooth or something. Um, but that's a sign that your sheep has worms and you need to do something for it um, just to get rid of that. Another sign, is if your sheep are, well, in my case, I have wool sheep. So a sign for me is when they start losing wool in weird places at weird times of the year, that's a sign that they've got some type of worm. Um, lastly, for medical care, um, hooves are a big issue. You wanna prevent hoof rot at all costs. Um, that's caused by a bacteria. <clears throat> and that, that bacteria comes about whenever you have really moist soils. So the last couple of years, we've had some pretty mild winters. Um, so I know around our barn, it's basically a mud pit all the time and the sheep are constantly walking in that. So that wet, you know, mud and manure and everything else will soften up sheep hooves and let that bacteria get in their feet and then you've got hoof rot and hoof rot bacteria is contagious in sheep. So if one of your sheep gets it, chances are you're gonna have three or four or five sheep, you know, come down with sore hooves. Um, so you wanna keep that infection rate low and treat them as soon as you notice there's, you know, something wrong. See them limping around the field or laying down when they eat or getting down on their knees when they eat, that's a sign that there's an issue with their hooves. And if anybody has any questions while I'm saying this, feel free to put it in um, the chat box and Phil and Leanne can stop me and let me know what's going on. So <clears throat> the next thing you need to decide when you're dealing with sheep or with goats is what your lambing window is gonna be. And that is just the time of the year that you want your lambs to be born. And this picture is a picture of my lambs from last year. So we had a pretty good lambing season um, in 2020. One of the only good things that have come out of 2020. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> so lambing window is all dependent on when you were going to introduce your ram or your buck. Hold on one second. <laughs> Sorry about that, I had some 4 hers come in the office. So like I was saying, um, lambing window is all dependent on when you put your buck or your ram sheep in with your ewes. Um, in general, sheep and goats gestate for 150 days, that's five months. Um, you can pretty much set your watch by that 150 days. Um, when we first started off as sheep producers, we would put a marker on our ram so that we knew what day he serviced to you so that we could plot out when that 150 days was going to be. We could get that ewe pinned up um, or separated from the rest of the flock so that she could lay him on her own. Um, now, after 15 years of doing this, we don't mark our sheep anymore like that. We just let it ride and you know once you've gone through a few lambing seasons or kidding seasons you're going to be able to tell when your ewes or your does are going to get close to lambing 
Um, so I've got up here on the screen, if you introduce your ram or um, buck in August and September, you want to expect lambs um, around Christmas time through the end of February. October and November, it's going to be late February to the end of April. And then December to January, you're going to have lambs in the late spring, early summer. Your lambing window <clears throat> plays the biggest role on what type of shelter you need to have for your sheep or your goats. Um, what I'm about to talk about right now focuses mostly on sheep because that's what I have the most experience in. Sheep are designed to withstand the cold. So you don't necessarily need a lot of shelter for them in the wintertime. If you're gonna be lambing in you know, December, January, February, that's when you need to have good shelter so that your lambs can stay dry and you don't have to deal with hypothermia or you know, freezing of your lambs outside. So the open pasture method is for those late spring and summer lambs when it's not gonna be a big deal if they're born outside. It's, you know, it's probably gonna be warm weather. Um, your biggest issue when you're lambing in open pasture can be predators, but you know, that this cuts down on a lot of work for you. You don't have to keep lambing jugs clean. You don't have to keep a lot clean. Um, you know, your animals are just out living their life. Um, the lot method um, is more for earlier in the spring and late winter uh, lambing. It's low maintenance. All your animals are together. Um, they have you know, they have access to pasture, but at nighttime, they're going into a lot that's covered so that when they do lamb, nothing's freezing. You know, there's less chance of predators getting to them. Um, but like I said, it is more work for you. And then lambing jugs, which is what we use on our farm, is each you gets an individual stall in the barn where they're going to take care of their lamb for at least a week, maybe two weeks, depending on how well um, the lambs are doing. Uh, this creates better bonding, um, but it is high maintenance. You got to keep those places clean. You got to keep them dry. You have to constantly feed and water those animals. Um, so it can be a lot of work. If you have another full-time job along with farming, it can be a lot to you know, run lambing jugs. Between my dad and my mom and me, the three of us can take care of lambing jugs pretty easily. Um, but yeah, these are your three options for, um, for shelter as far as lambing goes. Hey, Hunter. Yeah, I see, I see it. Um, those lambing jugs, it kind of depends on what type of sheep you have. Um, for us, we have to, our lambing jugs have to be pretty big, it, probably at least eight by 10, because we have wool Suffolk sheep. So those are some big bodied sheep that take up a lot of space. Um, for smaller uh, breeds of sheep, you could go with an eight by eight, maybe a six by eight. Um, like I said, depending on how big those, those ewes are, and depending on how many lambs they have. If you have a ewe that you know, pops out triplets, you want to give her some more space to take care of those babies. If, you know, if they have a single, then, you know, it's not nearly as important to have a larger space. There we go. So here are the pros and cons of early and late lambing. Um, I do early lambing. Most of my lambs are going to be born from January 1st to the middle of February. So <clears throat> the cons, like I said, there's more need for shelter from wind, snow, rain, any weather issue. There's a higher risk of hypothermia among lambs. Um, confined spaces in a barn can cause a buildup of ammonia um, from urination from all of your animals. So if you don't have good um, airflow in those places, that can cause pneumonia in your sheep. Um, and then we have an increase of feed and hay consumption because they don't have constant access to pasture. 
And then some of the pros, we don't have to deal with predators when those ewes and lambs are in a lambing jug. They're inside the barn, they're protected. You know, we're not gonna have a coyote get in there and get our lambs. Um, there's a lower instance of parasites because they're separated from the rest of the flock. So that you can just focus on her and her babies and, you know, isn't going to get anything that's going around the rest of the herd. Um, lamb bonding uh, can be a big issue in some larger flocks. Um, we've had some ewes that have stolen lambs from other ewes. Um, so keeping those, you know, that you and her lambs in a jug for a few days is going to help them know exactly who their mom is and who their babies are. And there's not going to be any confusion among the flock. Then when we talk about late lambing, um, like I said, there could be a high risk of predation, uh, because sheep are typically, typically still going to be out on the field, um, with no protection from predators. Um, there's a high risk of parasites and fly strike when the temperature's warmer. Um, high risk of hoof rot, which we talked about earlier. And then, like I said, potential for use to steal lambs or reject their own lambs. And then the pros, less need for shelter, less need for nightly checks. And then you have plenty of pasture along with any type of hay that you have left. I don't know if you saw that uh, other question there. Uh, oh, make it square. Um, that's up to you. Um, we have square uh, lambing jugs. We've also got um, some circle lambing jugs that we put together. Um, so that's just kind of a preference. The way that our flock is now, um, when we start having one lamb, we will have all of our lambs within a couple of weeks. So we'll have several jugs that we take up and um, that we can put down and like take them apart if we need to. Um, so our barn will be crammed full of lambing, clam, ugh, crammed full of lambing jugs. So they all might be different shapes. Um, this is just a mock timeline of lambs being born, lambs being weaned, when to sell, when to put your ram in the next year, and then lambs born and weaned again. So, <clears throat> well, we're going to talk about all that in the next slide. So the next two slides are um, the lambing process. Uh, there's 10 stages to it. Um, the first stage is water sack emerges. So when we're lambing, we do a lot of checking on the flock every few hours every day. Um, in general, sheep are going to have their lambs really early in the morning or later in the evening, you know, 10, 11 o'clock. In my experience, if a ewe has not started going into labor before midnight, she's not going to go into labor until the next morning. So if you don't see that water sack emerged or you don't see a ewe separating herself from the flock, chances are you're not going to have a lamb that night. Um, in general, somebody gets up around 5 a.m. goes to the barn and checks to see if we've got any new lambs or if um, we have any land or any use in labor. Um, so like I said, stage one is the water sack. The ewe's gonna be, you know, keep to herself. She's gonna be separated from the rest of the flock. This is a point in the lambing process where a lot of farmers can get stressed out because it can take a while for something to happen after the water sack emerges. Do not, do not be alarmed if it takes, you know, 
45 minutes for you to start pushing the lamb out or for her or for you to see something happening um, before that lamb makes its way into the world. So stage two, the water sack has burst and that you is gonna start pushing. Um, she's probably gonna stand up and lay down continuously. Um, this could take 30 minutes to an hour. Um, if after an hour you aren't seeing um, a head or hooves coming out, then your use probably, you know, having some trouble and you might need to intervene at that point. Um, stage three, you should be able to see the hooves and the head. That is the proper way for a lamb to enter the world. It's the easiest way for you to push that lamb out. Um, it's going to have its hooves, its front hooves up above its head, and its nose and hooves will be coming out together. Um, stage four, that's the hardest part for the U, where she has to pass, pass the front shoulders. Um, if this takes more than 30 minutes, you need to pull that lamb out. Um, Lambs can easily get stuck in the birth canal. That's why we do so many um, checks throughout the day and night and early morning. Because if we have a younger you that's, you know, it's her first time lambing, she might have trouble pushing out a pretty large baby. So we've, you know, I've pulled hundreds of lambs over the last 15 years. And, you know, stage four is, that's the biggest question mark with where, whether or not you need to intervene. Um, stage five, the lamb should be on its way out. Stage six, on the ground, the lamb is, um, you know, trying to take its first breaths. Um, I typically don't help use clean off their babies, um, unless it's particularly cold. If it's around zero degrees, I might get in there and, um, you know, help clean it up a little bit. But in general, if it, you know, I have a you that's a good mother, I just leave her to do her thing at this point. Um, stage seven, the you is cleaning and bonding with the lamb. They're just getting each other smell. They're knowing, you know, what the next steps in getting this baby to a good position are going to be. After stage seven is when, um, you'll know if you're gonna have another lamb or not. So if your ewe lays down and doesn't um, pass any afterbirth, then chances are you're gonna have twins or you're gonna have triplets. So she's gonna rest for a little bit, still cleaning off her lamb. And then she's gonna get up and go through stages one through seven again. Um, stage nine, if you've got twins or triplets, the first lamb should be up and should be trying to nurse. Um, this can take a while for the lamb to figure out what it's doing, but th this is a time for you to be patient um, and don't get caught up in that, you know, your lamb isn't automatically nursing an hour after it's been born. And then stage 10, after birth is out, lambing is complete. The lambs are pretty much dried off and they've both, or, you know, the single or twins or whatever have all nursed. Um, these are some important items for you to have on hand whenever you're going through a lambing or kidding season. First is old towels and rags to help out um, with cleaning lambs if you need to do that. Next is colostrum. Um, colostrum and milk replacer kind of go hand in hand. You don't want to have to use it, but it's good to have it in case something happens to one of your ewes or you can't get a lamb to nurse or they get rejected by their mother or whatever. You want to have that colostrum available and that milk replacer um, so that, you know, you can give that lamb or kid the best chance of survival. Um, iodine is something good to have on hand. We use that um, to coat their navels to help 
prevent infection. Um, a tube feeder. Um, this is used, like I said, if a lamb can't nurse or it can't stand up well or the mother rejects it, a tube feeder can save a lamb or kid's life um, early on after it's been born. And then you also just want to have soap and water and that's to help keep um, your hands clean if you have to help birth one of the babies. So what to do once you have new lambs? The first day when a lamb has been born and I can't express enough how important it is for lambs to get that colostrum in the first 12 hours of birth. After 12 hours, if they haven't nursed and gotten colostrum from their mother, chances are they're not gonna make it or they're gonna lead a very tough life. Um, so that's something you need to do once your lambs are on the ground is to check back every you know, hour, two hours and make sure that that lamb has nursed at least one time. Um, then I have down there check uh, for body temperature. So the way you can do that is you can stick your pinky in a lamb's mouth. If it's warm inside that mouth, then its body temperature is fine. Um, you know your lamb or your kid is in trouble when you stick your finger in there and it's cold or it doesn't feel like the way a mouth should feel. Um, during the first week of your lamb's life, uh, you wanna tag that lamb so that you can document which you it belongs to. Um, this plays a big role when it comes in deciding who's going to the market or you know, if you wanna cull use later on or keep some of these use back for your flock. Uh, knowing which you your lamb came from will be beneficial. Um, for me, since I have wool sheep, uh, tail docking is important. Um, we dock their tails within a week of being born. Um, and then after that first week, you want to introduce the you and her lambs to the rest of the flock. Month one, um, if you didn't vaccinate your ewes while they were still gestating. You wanna do your CDT vaccinations. Um, like I said before, you don't wanna do those right after they're born. You wanna wait about six weeks um, to help keep that bacteria down. <clears throat> um, on tail docking, um, you should Dock the tails at least by the time a lamb is six weeks old. Um, conventional rubber bands like the ones I have on the screen are the best thing to use. Um, there's no blood involved. Um, it's painful for a little bit, but then it's not painful at all. Um, Docking tails for us cuts down on manure buildup on the sheep, makes shearing easier in the spring and makes use more accessible for breeding that next year. Um, in hair sheep, you don't typically dock tails, um, but I mean, it's you can still do that if you decided that you wanted to. Um, Next we have what to do after your lambs have aged a little bit. We typically wean our lambs at two to three months of age, depending on how big they are. If we've got some lambs that have grown quickly over their first couple of months and they are eating grain regularly, they're grazing regular, regularly, we will go ahead and separate those lambs off and start letting those ewes get dried up so that we can get their body condition um, back to a good point before fall breeding. Um, after three months of age, even if they're not super big, um, as long as they're eating grain regularly and grazing regularly, we will go ahead and separate those out too. Um, we dry lot all of our lambs at first when we um, wean them. We give them a lot of, we, they have free choice hay, um, all the time and then we feed them grain daily um, 
for the first two or three weeks. After those two or three weeks, um, we'll turn them out on pasture um, for a couple days a week. And then by about a month of being weaned, they're on pasture full time, there's less hay, and we're only giving grain sporadically. Um, for around here, ideal market weight um, for sheep is 65 to 80 pounds. Uh, that's when you're gonna get your best price typically. Um, and they're approximately five months old to six months old um, whenever they get up to that weight. So, oh, whoops. Pasture plans um, for your flock and this uh, could be before you weaned or after you weaned or whatever you wanna do. Um, one is continuous grazing. That's the least, um, the least amount of work for you. Your animals have access to as much forage as they want. Um, the issues that we find here are that weeds persist in those fields because the animals can decide what they want to eat and what they don't want to eat. So weeds are going to grow because they're going to eat all the good stuff and um, you know you're going to have to go back and take care of that eventually. Um, the next option you have is simple rotational grazing. This is in general what our farm does. We've got about four pastures that we rotate our flock through um, throughout the spring and summer and fall. Um, when forage is growing quickly, our rest periods aren't really that long. We'll give them about a week before we'll rotate. Um, in the fall, once the pasture, you know, isn't producing as much, we'll let the rest periods go a little longer. Um, the next option is to do intensive rotational grazing. So what that is, is having a lot of smaller pastures. You're rotating very quickly or, you know, very more frequently than you would in simple rotational grazing. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, to get those animals moved all the time and to, you know, keep fences up and all that. Um, but it's good for your, it's good for your pastures because they will eat everything down, um, including the weeds. And then we have the last option is mixed rotation or mixed spe species grazing. So that's having cows or horses or sheep and goats together, um, grazing the same pasture. Um, it helps with parasite control. Um, cattle and sheep and goats don't pass parasites back and forth. Bovine parasites are not going to get in your sheep and vice versa. So this can help cut down on parasite control. And the last thing I have to say about all this is do what works for you. Um, like I said at the beginning, everything that I've talked about today are things that we do on our farm. Um, we've had pretty decent success with that over the years. Um, but yeah, so if anybody has any questions, let me know. Hunter, thank you very much. That was, that was excellent. Um, anybody have any questions, you can either unmute your mic and ask or just type it into the chat box. But one question I have, I, it's, it's sort of related to lambing season, but here in Wise County, I think since you've left, we, we've just started to see some of the black vultures coming in. And yeah, I know that's a real susceptible time. Is that something that you see much of up in Bland County? Or have you had those? Um, we sometimes <laughs> um, we I have had people call um, to ask what they should do with prey birds getting on their sheep and goats like that. Um, I don't really have much of an answer for it. Um, I haven't had to deal with anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I would say, especially dogs, as far as protection animals, dogs will help with okay. that for sure. I don't necessarily know if uh, llamas or donkeys would help um, with birds, but I know that I think that dogs would. 
And we have a question from Matt Webb. Uh, where are we marketing our lambs up here? Uh, there's a lot of local livestock markets. Um, I take mine to the Narrows livestock market. A lot of people, um, if they have a larger flock or a larger herd of goats, will load up and go to um, Pennsylvania, um, to New Holland, where they're going to get more of a premium price. Um, but I don't do that. I don't have a big enough haul that I would take that far to make it worth my while. Uh, talk a little bit about how pregnancy toxicity may happen. Okay, so uh, we have a question about pregnancy toxemia. Um, and I didn't talk about free choice minerals before any time during this. So free choice minerals are something that should be available to all pregnant use and um, lactating use all the time. Um, that's going to supplement them with anything, especially because it's winter time, they're not on pasture, they're not getting everything that they would normally get um, from their forages. So having those minerals in there is gonna help cut down on anything um, as far as toxemia goes um, that they could get. Hey Hunter. Yeah. What type of, uh, I want to see what type of feed, uh, maybe you, some of the other people are feeding, uh, right now I'm feeding a, a three way feed, uh, that I get at the farm store, but, uh, on, on a visit over at, uh, the Castlewood farm store recently, he told me that it may have some copper in it. I was wondering if that, anyone else had heard that maybe Danny or anybody you, um, I don't know about if it has copper in it. And it was um, cool. Feed, I use a three-way that he feed. thought that, that the uh, copper may be on the gluten. I don't know. That's something I'd have to look at because I use a three-way feed too. Okay, that's what. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something we can find out about. He may have been trying to sell me the more expensive feed too. <laughs> yeah, that's possible. <laughs> How do I know if a you is experiencing toxemia? So in my experience with toxemia, um, I personally have not had it on this farm, but I know of a producer um, that has, or that did a couple years ago have a you with toxemia. Um, the you is very lethargic. Um, she had sores on her mouth and in her, on her tongue and she wouldn't eat anything. Um, so she didn't make it very long. Um, so toxemia is hard to treat after um, it's been set in for a few days. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so, Nadine's asking about um, diatomaceous earth to our lambs to help with worms. I have never given a lamb anything for worms. Um, 
normally whenever I have lactating ewes, if we happen to worm, it'll be during that time and they help pass worm immunity onto their babies. Um, typically, like I said, I'd, we don't have to deal with worms and lambs like that. I'm seeing some suggestions in the chat box too. Uh, Matt had, had talked about hanging dead vultures uh, to, to discourage the bite vultures from coming around. And if, if you're not, uh, not dealing with bite vultures yet, uh, you, you probably will eventually. Um, and let's see, Joanna has a link for some uh, uh, pregnancy toxemia information. And then also included another link from uh, Colorado State Extension. Okay, any any other questions for for Hunter before we close out this evening? Well, again, thank you all for for logging in. Um, I'm sure Hunter probably doesn't mind. He had a uh, an email on his his slide um oh, yeah. so, so if, if, if you don't mind typing that email in in the chat box i'm sure he yeah. wouldn't mind we'll have some questions later on but again thank you all very much for for logging in tonight and uh, hope you can join us on thursday on on thursday evening we have kyle hill from here in wise county he's a, a young man who's a uva wise student and an avid outdoorsman He's going to be talking uh, about waterfowl in the coal fields. He's been uh, doing some research and doing a project for, for a few years now, looking at the different species of waterfowl he's seen in the coal fields. And uh, just, um, I, I've, I've seen that presentation before. I'm sure he's added some species since then. And I'm always amazed at the number of species that he's seeing here in our part of the world. So I hope you can, can tune in for that. Um, Mary had asked, is this going to be available for viewing? It will be. And what I can do is I can send you the link to our YouTube channel. Let me put my email here. If you want to just email me and let me know that you're interested in, um, in getting the link for that, I'll probably get that up tomorrow. So you can go back and view this presentation. I'll be glad to send you that link once it's up and running. Hey, hey, Hunter, this is Jeremy Williams over in Harlan County. Uh, great information. Thanks so much. Uh, no problem. Thank you all for having me. Good stuff. Hey, Jeremy, you got anything to add for uh, for upcoming Zooms? Or? I don't. Uh, I know we've got several great ones coming up, so uh, uh, should be should be pretty good. Should be should be fun. Good, great information. Good stuff. All right, if there's nothing else, Hunter, again, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And, and this will be posted on our YouTube channel if people want to revisit that. And uh, hope you all have a good evening. All right, thanks.